Good afternoon, everybody. I've got about eight or nine slides here for you on uh, a group of poets who are known as uh, the Fireside Poets. So the Fireside Poets were a group of American poets, um, mostly from the New England, Boston area, and it was really the first group of poets to rival British poets in popularity in either country. Uh, as a group, they were uh, first and foremost true scholars. Um, uh, each of these poets uh, were formally educated, probably at Harvard, uh, or most of them at Harvard. Uh, Longfellow was educated uh, at Bowdoin, uh, which is in Maine, but they would have um, had the scholarship, the ability to read and write uh, both Greek uh, and Latin uh, quite easily. And they had a facility and uh, a great resilience in their lines of poetry uh, for the themes that they uh, imbued in their poetry. For this and other reasons, they were known as the schoolroom poets because, in part, their poems lent themselves to memorization and recitation, uh, often by uh, school-aged children, um, hence the name schoolroom poets. The term neoclassical is one that you need to be familiar with. It simply means that the type of poem that is presented on the page is very conventional and very traditional in its form, uh, in the sense that it would be uh, very, very traditional rhyme and meter and stanzaic form, nothing experimental, nothing innovative uh, in their poetry, really, at all. The poetry is also known for being highly didactic, and that's a word that you should know for a quiz or an exam. Uh, the term didactic is a term you may not be familiar with, uh, but what it means is that if, uh, if something is didactic, uh, let's say a particular poem by Longfellow, and we'll look at one when we get to Longfellow. It means that its purpose, by design, uh, by craftsmanship, is, is to teach or to impart a moral instruction uh, that supports uh, the status quo, that supports traditionally held beliefs and values. Um, the fireside poets often used American legends and scenes of American life as their subject matter. So when we get to Longfellow, you can look at the Song of Hiawatha. Longfellow is calling upon an American uh, legend, an American mythology, uh, and is uh, memorializing it in his poetry. So who were the Fireside Poets? Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, William Cullen Bryant, uh, James Russell Lowell, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and John Greenleaf Whittier. I think in this sort of truncated unit that we have by virtue of uh, our unique circumstances this semester, we're really only going to look at Longfellow and uh, William Cullen Bryant in great detail. Here you see a picture of Longfellow's home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's known as the Craigie House. It was gifted to him and to his second wife, uh, Frances Appleton, uh, uh, on the uh, event of their wedding. The Craigie House, though, has a very interesting uh, historical uh, background to it. Uh, George Washington himself used this home during the American Revolution as his headquarters. Here we have Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and you can see by his dates, he lived almost the, the entirety of the 19th century in America. He is without a doubt not only the most widely read, but certainly the most well-known and certainly the most popular American poet of the 19th century. Now, please notice that I did not say he was the best poet of the 19th century. And in fact, when we get to Ralph Waldo Emerson in his essay, 
called The Poet. He laments the fact that America has yet to create a true poet. And I always sort of wondered in the back of my mind what Longfellow thought of Emerson's uh, bold assertion. At any way, he composed uh, a poem such as Song of Hiawatha, Paul Revere's Ride, uh, and Evangeline. Uh, again, as a uh, individual who was uh, deeply uh, steeped in the classics, uh, he translated Dante's Inferno from the Italian to the English. And another distinguishing um, tribute to Longfellow's uh, a celebrated status as a poet is he is the first of only two American poets to have a bust in Westminster Abbey's Poets' Corner. Now, Westminster Abbey is in the United Kingdom. It's in England. And for the English to have an American poet there, uh, again, that speaks to and is a tribute to Longfellow's wide and celebrated appeal. Uh, as a footnote, the, the other uh, poet... American poet who has a bust in Westminster Abbey is none other than T.S. Eliot, a 20th century poet. Now for my money, uh, the best of the fireside or schoolroom poets is none other than William Cullen Bryant, uh, he gained a, a recognition first and is best known for one poem called Thanatopsis, which was published in 1821, written when he was still uh, a teenager, I believe around the age of 18 years old. We will look at Thanatopsis much more closely when we get to William Cullen Bryant. Uh, it's difficult to make a living as a poet, and so uh, Bryant, uh, as is the case with many poets of his uh, era, uh, had to make a living, had to have a vocation, uh, a means of generating revenue and sustenance. And so Bryant was a lawyer, uh, trained and sat uh, and practiced and read the law. He was also the editor of the New York Evening Post. He is, I would submit to you, one of the most American of poets, uh, short of uh, Walt Whitman. And he was one of the founders of the Republican Party and supporter of Abraham Lincoln, uh, during the middle of the 19th century. James Russell Lowell uh, came from one of the most prominent Boston families, the Lowell family. He, as so many of his contemporaries, uh, was active in the abolitionist anti-slavery movement, some, in fact, consider his long poem called A Fable for Critics, which is in our textbook, an early example of American literary criticism. And in this poem, what Lowell does is he does a, a treatment of uh, some of America's earliest writers and their contributions to American literature, but crafts what their contributions were uh, and sort of... Um, uh, gives us a sense of how they wrote with respect to style and tone and so forth. But he does it all within the construct of a poem. And some will point to a fable for critics as one of the earliest examples of American literary criticism. I guess other noteworthy uh, observations is that he, uh, along with several other Lowells, uh, really do make major contributions to American poetry. Amy Lowell and Robert Lowell, uh, descendants of James Russell Lowell, were themselves quite uh, successful uh, and um, legitimate poets of the 20th century in America. Now, I like me some Oliver Wendell Holmes as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, I always remember about Holmes is that he, by training and by vocation, he was a medical doctor. Uh, he invented the term anesthesia. Uh, he founded the American Medical Association. Uh, he was uh, 
responsible for the admittance of women into the medical school at Harvard University. And so he was a preeminent man of medicine uh, during this period. Um, another interesting thing about him was that he, he was known for always carrying a tape measure in his pocket because he was fascinated with uh, the human body. Uh, and so if he saw somebody, um, let's say, with uh, an extraordinary physique, he was apt to pull out this tape measure and uh, you know, make measurements of uh, the person's skull or the person's, you know, triceps and, uh, and so forth. Uh, interesting cat. Uh, he composed uh, Old Ironsides, which is also in our book, which helped save the USS Constitution from the scrapyard. Uh, his, my favorite poem of his, though, is in our book, and it's called The Last Leaf, uh, and it's a poignant, poignant little poem uh, about age and about the passage of time. Uh, if you get a chance, look at the last leaf. It's a meaningful poem to me. Uh, he was members. Uh, he was a member of the Saturday Morning Club, which was just a group of uh, individuals uh, who would get together uh, and socialize and discuss things literary. He helped found and name and edit the Atlantic Monthly. That's a pretty big deal. The Atlantic Monthly was America's really first uh, true literary magazine. Uh, and it is, in fact, still in publication today. If you go to Barnes & Noble or if you go online and type in the Atlantic Monthly, you'll find it. And Oliver Wendell Holmes himself uh, helped establish that fine publication. I'm not really too well versed on the poetry of John Greenleaf Whittier, uh, no pun intended. Um, he was, though, by his ancestry, a devoted Quaker. And if you remember from our conversations in class that I think I may have mentioned to you that whenever you meet a Quaker, they're usually a pretty good people. And this is the case with Whittier. Um, he was known as the slave's poet. He was quite active in the Underground Railroad uh, and in the anti-slavery movement uh, in general. His most famous poem, perhaps, is called Snowbound, which was published in 1866, which was sort of a retrospective look at what life was like for him growing up as a young boy in Massachusetts when the fire and the, uh, I'm sorry, when the family would gather around the fireside during a snowstorm. Honestly, the fireside or the schoolroom poets as a group of poets really don't get that much critical attention or that much praise by modern readers right now. And that's in part due to that didactic nature of their poems. Oftentimes they're dismissed as being, as a group, over, overly sentimental. Um, and most modern readers don't quite like that sort of heavy-handed uh, preaching or moralizing uh, when they read their poetry. Nevertheless, as a group, they have, in fact, quite a long and lasting impact. Longfellow, as I mentioned, w remained the most popular American poet for decades. Uh, when Edgar Allan Poe criticized Longfellow, Poe was all but ostracized. The New England writers were not big fans of Edgar Allan Poe, and uh, I could pause here and, and give you a couple reasons why that is. Uh, most literary activity was, um, was going on in New England. And as a group, I think the New Englanders sort of looked down their noses at Poe, who would have been considered uh, an outsider to that group, would have been considered a, uh, a Southerner, uh, even though he was in Maryland and in Virginia. Uh, most of his personal and professional lives, as I recall, 
the second reason that uh, this group of poets and maybe this uh, maybe larger circle of American romantic writers uh, were not too keen on Poe is that, uh, and this is I think a good observation, if you think about the poetry, you think about the stories of Edgar Allan Poe, they, they truly don't seem at all related or identifiable as American. Think about those stories. Oftentimes they're set in sort of uh, European uh, uh, settings, aren't they? Um, in France, and they have a different complexion, a different feel to them. There's nothing that when you pick up a Poe story, let me put it this way to you, when you pick up an Edgar Allan Poe story and you open it up, you don't get the sense by either the theme or the style of the writing that what you're reading was crafted by an American poet. And remember, or American writer, and if you recall, this one of the characteristics of American Romanticism, one of their objectives was to create an American literature, to create a, a literary culture that was truly uh, uh, American in its roots and in its traditions uh, and somehow independent of European and English ancestors. I would submit, too, that uh, part of their impact is felt on the social issues and the causes that are introduced and presented to the population in their poetry, such as the abolition of slavery, which brought the issues to the forefront, to the American public, uh, and to the uh, international public as well, in a very straightforward and accessible way. And then finally, through their scholarship, through the editorial efforts, as I mentioned in the Atlantic Monthly, in the translations uh, of Dante, of the Iliad, of the Odyssey, and so forth, they paved the way for later Romantic writers like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and Walt Whitman. Hey, thanks for paying attention, and I'm glad that you guys are here. I miss you guys, and uh, I hope that you all stay well. I'm thinking about you. You are all in my thoughts and in my prayers. Be well.